then this happened. My internet broke one day, as it occasionally does, and the cable guy came to fix it, and he started with the dusty clump of cables behind the couch, and he followed it to the front of my building, and into the basement, and out to the backyard, and there was this big jumble of cables against the wall. And then he saw a squirrel running along the wire, and he said, there's your problem. A squirrel is chewing on your internet. <laughs> and then I got this image in my head of what would happen if you yanked the wire from the wall, if you started to follow it, where would it go? Was the internet actually a place that you could visit? And I visited places like this, 60 Hudson Street in New York, which is one of the buildings in the world, one of a very short list of buildings, but a dozen buildings, where more networks of the internet connect to each other than anywhere else. And that connection is an unequivocally physical process. It's about the router of one network, of Facebook or Google or BT or Comcast or Time Warner, or whatever it is, connecting with usually a yellow fiber optic cable up into the ceiling down to the router of another network. And that's unequivocally physical. And it's surprisingly intimate. These build, a building like 60 Hudson and the dozen or so others has 10 times more networks connecting within it than the sort of next tier of buildings. So there's a very short list of these places. And 60 Hudson in particular is interesting because it's home to about a half dozen very important networks, which are the networks that serve the undersea cables that travel underneath the ocean, that connect Europe and America and connect all of us. Because there are cables underneath the ocean, cables like this, and in this dimension, they are incredibly small. You can hold them in your hand. They're like a garden hose. But in the other dimension, they are incredibly expansive, as expansive as you can imagine. Uh, they stretch across the ocean. They're three or five or 8,000 miles in length. Light goes in on one end of the ocean and comes out on the other. And it usually comes from a building called a landing station that's often tucked away inconspicuously in a little seaside neighborhood. And there are amplifiers that sit on the ocean floor that look kind of like bluefin tuna. And every 50 miles, they amplify the signal. And this is the rate of transmission is incredibly fast. The basic unit is a 10 gigabit per second wavelength of light. Maybe 1,000 times your home connection are capable of carrying 10,000 video streams. But not only that, but you'll put not just one wavelength of light through one of, one of the fibers, but you'll put maybe 50 or 60 or 70 different wavelengths or colors of light through a single fiber and then you'll have maybe eight fibers in a cable, four going in each direction. And they're tiny, they're the thickness of a hair. And then they connect to the continent somewhere. They connect in a manhole like this. Literally, this is where the 5,000-mile cable plugs in. This is in Halifax, a cable that stretches from Halifax to Ireland. And the landscape is changing. Uh, three years ago, when I started thinking about this, there was one cable down the western coast of Africa, represented in this map by Steve Song, as that thin black line. Uh, now there are six cables and more coming, three down each coast. Because once a country gets plugged in by one cable, they realize that it's not enough. If they're going to build an industry around it, they need to know that their connection isn't tenuous but permanent. Because if a cable breaks, you have to send a ship out into the water, throw a grappling hook over the side, pick it up, find the other end, and then fuse the two ends back together and then dump it over. There's an intensely, intensely physical process. So this is my friend Simon Cooper, uh, who until very recently uh, worked for Tata Communications, the communications wing of Tata, the big Indian industrial conglomerate. And Tata had gotten its start uh, as a communications business when they, when they bought two cables, one across the Atlantic and the, one across the Pacific, and proceeded to add pieces onto them until they had built a belt around the world, which means they will send your bits to the east or the west. They have, this is literally a beam of light around the world. And if a cable breaks in the Pacific, it'll send it around the other direction. And Simon was working on a new cable, WAX, the West Africa cable system that stretched from Lisbon down the west coast of Africa to Cote d'Ivoire, to Ghana, to Nigeria, to Cameroon. He said to go to this beach south of Lisbon, and a little after nine, this guy will walk out of the water. <laughs> and he'll be carrying a green nylon line, a lightweight line called a messenger line. And that was the first link between sea and land, this link that would then be leveraged into this 9,000 mile path of light. Then a bulldozer began to pull the cable in from this specialized cable landing ship, and it was floated on these buoys until it was in the right place. Uh, and then once that cable was on shore, they began to prepare to connect it to the other side, to, to the cable that had been brought down from the landing station. And first they got it with a hacksaw, and then they start sort of shaving away at this plastic interior with a, like, sort of working like chefs. And then finally they're working like jewelers to get these hair-thin fibers to line up with the cable that had come down. And with this hole punch machine, they fuse it together. 
And what surprised me as well was that as much as this is based on the most sophisticated technology, as much as this is an incredibly new thing, the physical process itself has been around for a long time. And the culture is the same. You see the local laborers, you see the English engineer giving directions in the background. And more importantly, the places are the same. These cables still connect these classic port cities, places like Lisbon, Mombasa, Mumbai, Singapore, New York. And then the process on shore takes around three or four days. And then when it's done, they put the manhole cover back on top, and they push the sand over that, and we all forget about it. And we should know what it is that physically, physically connects us all. Thank you.